Habib Allah Allah our God is the greatest The one and only glory to Him He wanted humans to be the best And give His best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest The one and only glory to Him He wanted humans to be the best And give His best religion to them السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبيه ومصطفاه وبعد My dear viewers, welcome to another live edition of our program Gardens of the Pious and today's episode is number uh, 382 and it will be the first in studying chapter number 144 in the book of Iyadut al-Marid, the first chapter, visiting the sick. The first hadith we have is hadith number 894. That's a very sound hadith narrated by Al-Bara ibn Azib radiyallahu anhuma qal Amarana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallama bi'iyadat al-marid واتباع الجنازة وتشميت العاطس وإبرار المقسم ونصر المظلوم وإجابة الداعي وإفشاء السلام متفق عليه البراء بن عازب may Allah be pleased with him and his father narrated that the messenger of Allah peace be upon him has ordered us to visit the sick to follow the funeral of a dead believer, respond to the sneezer by saying, Yarhamuka Allah, to help those who vow to fulfill it, to help the oppressed to accept the invitation which is extended by an inviter, and to promote the greeting of As-Salam by saying As-Salamu Alaikum or to the end Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh These are the teachings of our beautiful religion my dear respected brothers and sisters my dear viewers Muslims and non-Muslims you want to learn about Islam study the teachings of this messenger of Allah peace be upon him whom when Abdullah ibn Salam, may Allah be pleased with him, said once he entered al Medina as a muhajir, the first thing I heard from him was, O oh people, Afshu Salam, spread peace and the greeting of peace, At'imu al-Ta'am, and feed those who are in need, be hospitable, be generous, وصلوا بالليل والناس نيام, and offer prayer at night while people are asleep in order to enter paradise the heaven of your Lord peacefully these are the principles of our beautiful religion to be kind to people to be helpful to be in to be there for those who are in need and to have a good relationship with your creator not only in public, but in private, to pray some parts of the night while people are asleep, that will secure you a seat and a place in heaven. The command of Amarana indicates that it is mandatory. So it is obligatory upon us to do the following uh, commandments. One, Iyadat al Marid, second, Ittiba'u al Janaza. Tashmeet al is the third, Ibrar al is the fourth, Nasr al is the fifth, Ijabat al Da'i is the sixth, and Ifsha al Salam is the seventh. These are seven commandments. And these seven commandments are Fardu Kifaya. In case that some Muslims have fulfilled them, then the rest will not be blameworthy. But only the person who fulfilled it will be rewarded will be compensated for it, will be appreciated by Allah the Almighty. If somebody sneezes, if a Muslim sneezes while we're sitting, so 
if no one says to him, Ya Hamuk Allah, then everybody is blameworthy. Everybody has committed a big sin. But if only one person said, Ya Hamuk Allah, he will be rewarded for that, and the rest, no reward. But they are not blamed because at least somebody said it. That is the meaning of a communal duty. If only one person did it, then the rest are exempt. Then if a few people have done it, then obviously the rest are exempt. Exempt from what? Exempt from the blame, but deprived from the reward. Because man amila salihan, only whoever does good, min zakarina unsa. So if you do, if you work, if you do good deeds, then you will be rewarded for that. Those seven commandments, which we said, that are communal duties, not individual duties. If any person, if any Muslim have fulfilled it, then the rest are not to be blamed. The first command is Iyadat al marid And we said Iyadat al marid you can say in Arabic also Ziyarat al marid if you attended those Arabic classes. And you say, Shaykh, what is the difference between Ziyara and Iyada? This is a very fine difference. A Ziyara, when you visit somebody even once, okay, that's called Ziyara. When the three angels visited Ibrahim alayhi salam, that's called Ziyara. Hal ataka hadithu dayfi Ibrahim al mukramin That's called Ziyara, visit. But Iyada is a frequent visit is a visit which is repeated at the same place to the same person. And why do we use this term of ziyara or visit? We use the word iyada when it comes to the sick. Because it is not one time deal. Rather, we're encouraged and it is recommended for us to visit the sick person as much as you can. Obviously, unless if the sick person or if the physician or the specialist said no visitations. There is a very big risk for visiting or whenever somebody visits a sick person, he may get emotional or because of the infection or because of whatever. So we need to keep him isolated. That's a different case. Even though sometimes when the visitations is not permitted, they have a screen and the person will be standing, seeing the patient and the patient will be seeing him. So this is also very helpful. Some people say, what is the purpose of visiting somebody from behind a screen? The purpose is huge. Number one, for you to earn the reward. This whole chapter will be talking about that. Number two, it gives an assurance to the patient. He benefits out of your dua. It makes him feel better. It makes him feel better. You know, brothers and sisters, those who happen to be sick, they know what I'm talking about. When they see their loved ones, their friends coming to visit, whether they're carrying roses or even empty-handed, it doesn't matter. What matters is seeing you in front of them. That makes them feel better. People care about me. And they come, and they come again, and they come again. They keep visiting and make them feel happy. The night time is the worst part of the day for those who are sick. Why? And sometimes you have to increase the dose of the analgesics. Why? Because during the day, people are visiting, so that lightens the pain, and it makes it easier for the person. It distracts their attention from aching and the pain, and they're busy with their guests, talking to them, making dua for them, seeing them, socializing with them, while at the night time, it's such a long time. It seems like the night is never ending. And the patient is aching, is complaining, is, is in severe pain. It is the same pain during the day or the night. But his feeling, his endurance to the pain during the night is less than the day. Because no one is visiting. Even the nurses, if you need the nurse, you have to press the button. You have to ring the bell. You know, they are not sitting with you in most cases, I mean. So visiting the sick is very helpful for the sick person and for you. Besides the word, visiting the sick person is very helpful for
for the people who pay the visit or do the iyadah because it brings your attention some of the countless blessings which I, you, and all of us have been negligent of. When the patient said, SubhanAllah, I was just going to work and all of a sudden I felt like my knees couldn't bear me anymore. So they rushed me to the hospital when I fell and said, do you need a knee replacement? You start touching your knees. Oh, alhamdulillah, I was playing soccer yesterday. I was jogging in the track. Oh, you're able to walk. You're able to move freely. That's a great blessing. Maybe you've never paid attention to it in your life. Why? Because I, I, I don't have to say you or he or she or me. All of us, we take it for granted. We only realize that it was such a big blessing when we lose it, when we miss it. The sight, the hearing, the ability to talk, the ability to walk. So when you visit somebody at the hospital and you know his medical condition, number one, you appreciate the blessings that you're still enjoying and you're trying your best to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to maintain it for you. And there is a dua in this regard. You don't only pray for the patient or the sick person, but the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if you see somebody been afflicted with anything, then you say, Alhamdulillah, illadhi afana, mimma abtala bihi ghayrana, wa faddalana ala kathir min khalqihi tafdila. Obviously, this is in plural. He can say it in singular. Alhamdulillah, illadhi afani. Praises be to Allah, who protected me, who pardoned me, who kept me healthy and saved me from what? مِمَّا بِتَلَى بِهِ غَيْرِي from whatever he afflicted others with whether it's sickness, poverty, loss of limb or whatever okay? وَفَضَّلَنِي عَلَى كَثِيرٍ مِنْ خَلْقِهِ تَفْضِيلًا and he made me superior and he favored me over many of his creation ah, uh, this dua seems to be in line with the observation which I mentioned earlier appreciating the blessing which we have been taking for granted for years only before you miss it, before you lose it, whenever you see somebody else have lost it. Very interesting story of an old man, 80 plus, had urine retention and he was suffering badly and started screaming, his blood is full and he cannot leak out the urine. And he was crying out of pain. Soon they rushed him to the hospital and in the ER they put the catheter and they leaked the urine out, out of his bladder and he felt better. And now his sons were very happy that their dad started feeling better. So they looked for the doctor and they thanked him. Everybody is busy to thank the doctor because he made their father feel better and the father was crying. He said, are you okay? Is there anything was still, you know, painful? Do you feel any pain? He said, no, I just realized that for 80 years, for 80 years, I have been urinating easily without the need or the help or the assistance of anyone. No doctor have to help me to urinate, to pass urine. I have been urinating easily. I get up at night or during the day or while working at any time. You just go to the bathroom and you answer the call of nature. And I only realize now how great was such blessing. You realize it when you lose it. So one of the benefits of visiting the sick, you see, the old man saw his sons and everybody was very grateful to the doctor for helping their father to empty his bladder once. How many times you do it every day? How many times? How many times whenever you feel the urge to answer the call of nature, you just go to the bathroom? You know, maybe you just have some complaints that you don't have the toilet paper, uh, you don't have uh, the nice fragrant soap, or but these are all minor things. But at least you're capable to pass urine, to empty your bladder, to answer the call of nature. That's a, that's a huge blessing. What do you think? 
That's why one of the blessed Imams, when the Khalifa was late and did not attend the prayer in the masjid in congregation, those beautiful days when the Imam was the Khalifa, was a Muslim leader, was the leader of the believers, and he used to come to the masjid to lead the prayer five times a day. So when he was late, he visited him and he asked him, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, O leader of the believers, I was thinking about, God forbid, if there is a big drought and people were dying out of thirst, no water to drink, how much would you pay in order to get a sip of drink? He said, I would pay all my kingdom, my domain, to save my life. He said, what about if the person happens to drink and he's not able to take it out, having urine retention? How much would you pay to leak it out? He said, I would pay all my domain to be relieved. He said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, so your domain, your kingdom is not worth a sip of drink, sharbat ma, a sip of water. All of us must realize that our work is not much more important than the prayer. No, the prayer is more important. How often people call in and say, Sheikh, because I'm a teacher, because I'm uh, an engineer, because I'm a doctor and I'm seeing a lot of patients, you know, it's your own clinic, your own clinic. You're the boss. You manage your time whichever way you like. But some people are asking, because I'm very busy, very famous doctor, mashallah, I have about 40, 50 patients every night to see. So if I take a break to pray, it's five minutes, seven minutes, waste of the time, waste. Is this how you perceive it? You think this is a waste of time? You could have seen one or two patients during this time? No, 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 no. We gotta correct our perception. We gotta change our understanding and Realize the purpose of life in Surah al dhariyat This is what Allah the Almighty said. If you're not aware of that, let me remind you. وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ This is what we were created for, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Work and earning our provision comes second. Taking care of anything that is worldly comes second or third. But number one, fulfilling your duties towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a little problem here. You know, those who visit the sick and they take heed and they realize that Alhamdulillah I've been blessed and so on, they may benefit out of that. But sometimes doctors who are seeing patients every day, every day, every day, and they got used to hearing the aching and the pain and all of that and the complaints, they, again, they got used to it. Don't let this happen to you. Remember, you're blessed. Remember that those people who are lying on bed, they cannot do what they used to do before. Do it now while you're healthy. This is one of the most important benefits of visiting the sick, which benefits the visitor himself. The second is ittiba'u al-janaza. Sometimes you hear the word janaza and jinaza, the spelling is the same, but there is a little difference in the vowel. On the top, on top of the letter jim, janaza, that's a zabar, fatha. Or sometimes you say jinaza. Is it janaza or jinaza, and what difference does it make? Or it doesn't make any difference. In fact, it does. Al-janaza refers to deceased who's carried in the casket or on the piece of wood to the graveyard. While al-janaza is the tool on which we carry the dead person. It could be a casket, it could be um, you know, board of wood that we carry the dead person on top of it, so it's called Jinaza, whenever it is empty. While janaza is whenever it is busy and carrying the deceased or the body, the dead body of the person whom were taken to the graveyard. So following the janaza is a Muslim duty. 
is a Muslim deity. Very interesting story that one of uh, the people in the States, he died and no one of his family members knew that he's a Muslim. But his wasiya to his mother, that if I die, take me to this Islamic center and have people deal with my body. So that was his wasiya and his mother fulfilled it. Now when he died, all his family members came to attend his funeral. And they saw people they do not recognize. The Islamic center was full. The masjid was full of people. And they asked them, all of you guys were friends of our son and our brother? No. So how long have you known him? We don't even know him. We don't know his name. So why did you come? What did you come to attend his funeral? People were asking, just wondering. Said, because he's Muslim. Just because he's Muslim. You came to attend the funeral. He left work because it was work time, working hours. And you guys left work and left in order to attend the funeral of somebody whom you don't know. Yes, that's his right upon us. Several family members of his family on the day accepted Islam. His mother just realized why this child of hers was the best of her sons, was the person who used to take care of her most. She said, I figured that was ever since he converted to Islam. Ittiba'u al-Jana'iz has again benefits for the dead person and for the person who's following the janaza, the dead person. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, if you follow, you see janaza refers to the dead person whom we are following his funeral to the graveyard. Janaza refers to the funeral itself, even without the body. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, this is how much, how much thawab or word you get, a mountain of good deeds, similar to the mountain of Uhud, for attending the funeral prayer. You want to double it? Follow the janaza to the barrier place, to the graveyard. Double reward. Two mountains. Each one is similar to the mountain of Uhud. What about the dead person? As for the dead person, the Prophet ﷺ said, whenever 40 people who do not associate partners to Allah in worship attend the funeral prayer and they make dua for the dead person, his sins will be forgiven. Their intercession will be accepted and Allah will grant him forgiveness. That's why we're very keen to attend the funeral prayer, to benefit our dead brother or sister, right? And if we were to follow to the graveyard, wallahi, sometimes you attend the prayer in the masjid, and of course there is a funeral, so you attend the funeral prayer because you don't want to miss that much reward. Then they say, we're going to bury this person here or there. You look and you're watching and say, I think I have time. Let me make it. And you go, and none of the family members recognize you, but Allah does. It doesn't matter. So you give the condolence. This is a reward for you and an assurance and condolence for the family of the dead person. And now your footsteps to the, you know, to the graveyard and burying the person. Look, I'm telling you, you got a mountain of good deeds. This mountain as huge as the mountain of Uhud. Then also the Prophet ﷺ said to his companions as they were leaving, hang on. Sit tight. Why? He said, Istaghfiru lakhikum fa innahu al-ana yusal. Right now, your brother will be cautioned by the angels in the grave, Munkar and Nakir. He needs your dua. He needs your support. Hang on. Sit tight for 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Make dua for him. So you see how the ummah benefit each other, love one another, not only whenever the person is alive, but after death as well. And whether we know that person or we don't. What Tashmeet al atas who spoke about it in the previous uh, chapter, which is to say, Allah, then he says, provided he says, Alhamdulillah, he or she, then he says, يَرْحَمُكُمُ Allah. Then he says, يَهْدِيكُمُ اللَّهُ يصلح بَلَكُمْ Beautiful. We keep praying for each other. Why? Because we sneezed. وَإِبْرَارِ الْمُقْسِمِ We'll talk about that, inshallah, after we take uh, a short break. So please 
hang on and stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. I would like to remind you that this is a live episode of Gardens of the Pious. Our no phone number should appear on the bottom of the screen as follows area code 002, then 01005469323, alternatively area code 002, then 02385532. Uh, for those who would like to give us a call during this segment of the program and the email address is gardens at huda.tv the following commandment of the prophet وسلم, was ibrarul muqsim which is to fulfill the vow of a person who vows to do anything especially if it is relating to you such as if somebody asks you by allah to visit him so do your best to fulfill his oath. Ibrarul Muqsim is such a great deed. And it is also a command from the Prophet وسلم, to help those who vow to fulfill it. Your mom have asked you to visit her brother or somebody and says, Billahi alayk, I ask you by Allah to do that. But you know, I don't like my uncle. I'm boycotting my brother. I ain't talking to my sister. That is Ibrarul Muqsim. She says, Wallahi. As long as the qasam or the oath or the vow was to do something that is permissible. Uh, you're about to beat somebody, you're about to fire somebody, and uh, uh, you know, your dad said, I ask you by Allah not to do. Oh, you don't know what they did. I got to do this. I got to do that. I ask you by Allah not to do. Okay. I'm going to fulfill your vow or your oath. That's called Ibraru al-Muqsim. Or Ibraru al-Qasim. Al-Muqsim is the fa'id, the subject. وَنَصْرِ الْمَظْلُومِ Zulm means injustice and oppression. Zalim is the oppressor mazloom is the oppressed one and the prophet sallallahu commanded supporting and helping those who are oppressed there is no such thing in islam to say it's none of my business or anyone would say whenever you intervene to help those who are oppressed to say it's none of your business no it is indeed my business it is indeed my business to help and support the oppressed in Syria, but you live in Pakistan. They belong to us and we belong to them. Today, in Al Ghuta, in Syria, the, the, the criminal regime of Assad, the Nusairi Alawi regime, in addition to the Russian forces, are bombarding them for the past couple of days at least 300 civilians have been massacred seven from one family you know seven kids and their mom were massacred when you see that you don't say it's none of my business or because i'm an american or british or french and these guys are syrians in our ummah there is no such thing that's why the enemies of Islam fear most that this Ummah one day will be united. So those who are living in Turkey or in Egypt or in Pakistan or in China would react whenever any harm touches our brothers and sisters who are in Gaza. Because Gaza does not belong to Palestine. It belongs to the Muslim Ummah. It's a part of the Muslim Ummah. We do not recognize nationalism. Nationalism was introduced to the Ummah through the occupation forces in order to divide us. So even within Asham itself, Asham has been always called Asham. You know what Asham is? Asham is Palestine, the whole Palestine. There is no such thing called Israel. The whole Palestine, Jerusalem, 
the capital of Palestine of the Muslims okay where Al Masjid Al Aqsa the farthest mosque and Qubba Al Sakhra and Jordan Lebanon and Syria all of these countries were not countries before Saks Spiegel they were one place called Asham and Asham was a segment of the Muslim Ummah under the big umbrella of the Khilafah Turkey the Middle East the Gulf there was no those small minute minute little states so if there is any problem here or there the whole Ummah has one army has one body to react to support to help those who are oppressed that is the main purpose for which jihad was ordained أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ قَاتِلُوا الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا That is the purpose of prescribing jihad to fight against those who fight against us to stop those who are trying to hinder people from the path of Allah and oppress the weak and the innocent that is نصر المظلوم the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith, Unsur akhaka zaliman aw mazluma. You gotta support your brother. He refers to all your brothers and sisters. Whether they are oppressing or being oppressed. This statement was coming before Islam. So when the companions heard it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it sounded weird. They don't just take anything and they just accept it. They said, O, o Prophet of Allah, pardon us. We know that we're supposed to help the oppressed, but how can we do Nusra to the oppressor? He said, by stopping him from his oppression. This is how you support him. This is how you save him. Because if you say it's none of my business and you let him continue, he will be ruined as well. You stop the oppressor. You stop the oppressors from their oppression. And you help the weak and the oppressed. Look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Hujurat. Even if two parties of the believers happen to fight, you don't say it's none of our business, you stand and watch. وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمْ Try to reconcile between them. If it works, alhamdulillah, that is the greatest deed. And if it doesn't, and one of them is using arms and is really oppressive against others, فَقَاتِلُوا الَّتِي تَبْغِي حَتَّى تَفِيئَ إِلَىٰ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ So all of us will fight against the oppressors. Does it matter whether they are same nationality? The Ummah is one nationality, Muslims. The Ummah, the Muslim Ummah, is not supposed to recognize these geographical borders and boundaries. The whole earth belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're supposed to help the weak and the oppressed. Only if they're Muslims, of course not. We help the weak and the oppressed whether Muslims or non-Muslims. وَإِجَابَةِ الدَّاعِي We spoke about it before. If somebody invited us, we should do our best to accept their invitation. Provided he's inviting us to do something good. Remember once somebody shared with me that he made tawbah and he went for hajj and he quit all the wrong that he used to do, including drinking. And after Hajj, his old company friends invited him again, and he served drink, alcohol, wine, and stuff like that. So they offered him, and he said, no, I, um, I ain't drinking anymore. They said, why don't you drink? Why did you quit? And since when he said, because I made Tawbah, and I went for Hajj, and I quit. They said, well, you can drink and go back for Hajj. You can drink and make tawbah again. See the, the effect and the influence of the evil company. So if somebody is inviting you to a party and you know that a lot of haram will be involved, I don't care the least. Even if this person, the closest person to me, it's my brother's wedding, my sister's whatever, but you know that haram will be involved. I ain't attending. It's as simple as that. But if it is something good, then we are commanded to accept the invitation, especially if you're invited by the name. 
يعني sometimes you get invitation cards in the mail or somebody drops a message it will be very lovely to see you tomorrow for our wedding walima okay you should go if you have time if you're not available you're not blameworthy but now when somebody picks up the phone and says brother so and so he will honor me to receive you on the day for our whatever my son's graduation and having walima for my daughter's aqiqa for uh, my own walima he invited you by the name and this lot was empty in your schedule you should attend it becomes compulsory why to honor your brother to honor your sister whenever they make an effort to invite you what if sha is salam if sha is spreading as salam is peace and here it means spreading the greeting of peace as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said alqi as salam ala man arafta wa man lam ta'rif min al muslimin you're walking in the streets of Mecca and in Medina. You're going up, you're going down in the elevator. You're going to the front desk, to the restaurant. You meet the waiters. You meet the uh, helpers. You meet the uh, janitor. You meet anyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Do I know you, brother? Oh, no, we don't know each other personally, but we know that we're Muslims. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. And you greet the people who are the housekeeping the same way you greet the hotel manager. You greet the company owner. You greet your employer with a beautiful smile and appreciation. So that is ifsha or salam. Whether you know the people or you don't. The following hadith is another hadith which is agreed upon its authenticity and narrated by Abu Hurairah. رضي الله عن أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال حق المسلم على المسلم خمس رد السلام وعيادة المريض واتباع الجنائز وإجابة الدعوة وتشميت العاطس متفق عليه أبو هريرة رضي الله عنه reported the messenger of Allah peace be upon him said Every Muslim has five rights over another Muslim. So it is compulsory. It is your duty towards every other Muslim. Number one, Raddu Salam. He greeted you, you should greet them back. وَإِذَا حُيِّيتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ فَحَيُّ بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّوهَا the divine instruction, if you are being greeted with a greeting, to reply with one which is better. And if somebody says, Assalamu alaikum, how would you greet him with a better reply? Wa rahmatullah, then Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, or wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, or wa maghfiratuh as well, as we discussed in the chapter of replying the salam. Okay? He perhaps said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, sister? How are you guys? How are you doing? How is the family? That's extra. At least, at least, if you're not generous enough to give a better reply, then similar to it. Bi ahsan minha awrudduha. Or at least reply with one which is similar to it exactly as is. وَعِيَادَةُ الْمَرِيدُ We spoke about it earlier. Visiting the sick person back and forth based on the need of the sick person and whether he likes that or not. But we need to um, learn whenever you visit a sick person, how long should you hang around? And what do you say? You know? What do you say there? Number one, you hang around based on what the patient likes. And obviously, whatever you can afford because nowadays everybody's busy. We have a lot of other commitments. We are like in a blender, non-stop. So if you know that your visit is very helpful and it improves the health of the person, at least psychologically, then increase the visitations. That increases your reward and it benefits the sick person. Everybody is benefiting. And as long as you're sitting, whenever you visit a sick person, remind them of number one, tawbah, repentance. Because one of the great um, 
you know, objectives of getting sick is also to remember Allah, to make dua, to seek forgiveness for your past sins. So remind the person of making tawbah and give him hope that he will recover, he will survive, he will live a long life and he will see beautiful and bright days and he will come out of this hardship soon. Inshallah, Allah will deliver him out of this hardship. Even if the person is terminal ill, yes, even if the person told by the doctor that he's not gonna make it and he will die tomorrow. If you sit next to a patient who is expiring, what do you do after this call? Assalamu alaikum. Mother Abu Aisha from Sudan. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Ya Shaykh, Zakilah Khair. Zana wa iyaakum. Barakallah feekum. Barakallah, inshallah. Um, I just wanted to ask briefly, I have just now you mentioned uh, the, the rights of the Muslim upon you. Like one of them being if you are invited to an Africa or program at home, you should attend. Mm. In the event that you know that these people are programming like a music festival, if you may call it that way, do you still need to go or you can take excuse and uh, refuse to attend such programs? Okay. Yes, I know. Yeah. Barakallah feekum, Abu Aisha. I did answer this question when I said, you accept the invitation provided, no haram is involved. Well, I didn't know Shaykh, and I just went, and I just realized that there is haram. Okay, bro, good to see you. Thank you so much. I got to leave. Oh, well, you didn't eat. You didn't even have a drink next time. What is wrong? You know, because I can sit in this mixed environment and people are dancing and all of that. Okay, so you deliver a message. You don't just live away and that's it. I, I, I remember once somebody invited me for a wedding and they know what is haram and what is halal and so on. So when I walked in, I realized that everybody was like sitting together, men and women, but they have a table for me where no women were sitting. And music out loud and they were getting ready to start dancing so I told the brother I'm sorry I, I gotta leave he said why what is wrong I said look it is not befitting for me to sit here and uh, congratulations I have to go and I gave him an advice you know to have a good beginning for their wedding life and and so on subhanallah so he said okay let me escort you and he felt very embarrassed and he, was, he said I'm we're gonna turn off the music and while well, he was taking me to the uh, elevator, a young girl, teenage girl, with her colleagues, they stopped me, they intercepted my wife, and they said, Sheikh, you're Sheikh Muhammad Salah. I said, yes. She said, I want to ask a question. I said, sure. She said, what are you doing here? Like that. Trust me, like that. You know? And uh, before I say a thing, so the host said, let me answer. As a matter of fact, he didn't expect that. And when he saw that, he just walked in and he decided to leave. And that's why he's standing by the elevator. It is not because people recognize you and you will be sitting and people know that you're... No, it's about you yourself. You know what is halal and what is haram. So beforehand, if you know that this is going to be wrong, don't go and give him the explanation. Why? But if you don't and you go and you find that, alhamdulillah, congratulations, I have, to, uh, I have to leave. If somebody is dying and you're sitting next to them or visiting them, we know in the hadith that the Prophet sallallahu said that the lucky person is the one who will get to say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah before his death. Because whoever's last statement is la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah shall enter paradise. But not everyone will have an access to it, especially if the person is in severe pain and is, it's very problematic. A lot of things overwhelming him or her. It will be sufficient to sit next to them and keep saying quietly, but in a heard voice, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. This is a kind reminder. You will find the person joining you. Going with the flow. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Good. Say it. Alhamdulillah. Uh, you may ask the person, uncle or auntie, say la ilaha illallah. If they say it, calm down, slow down, 
because I know and I have seen some people say la ilaha illallah say la ilaha illallah and they say it say it again and again and again you don't want to hear them saying no I'm not saying it anymore because the way you're dictating to them you don't know what they are going through the pain of withdrawing the soul out of the body seeing the angels of death sitting around them you said la ilaha illallah once calm down let them now die in peace if it is time to die if they survive and they still several hours again every now and then la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah so the reminder or talqeen you know not directly dictating but maybe indirectly by raising your voice so that he could hear you saying la ilaha illallah so that it will be the best conclusion of the life of this person it was a pleasure brothers and sisters spend this precious time with you and until next time i leave you all in the care of allah aqulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and only glory to him he only humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he only humans to be the best and give his best religion to them so why did they ignore that Forgetting all about hell in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price Rasulallah